The book of Judges says that Samson killed more people when he died than when he lived. After this, there's really a stalemate between the Philistines and Israel. The Philistines raided Israelite villages and the Israelites burned Philistine fields. Individuals from both sides were at risk if they strayed into enemy territory. Neither kingdom triumphed. Politically, they also struggled in similar ways. There was no Philistine warlord who was able to pull the armies of all five cities of Pentapolis together behind him. And the judges of Israel, though they had authority as messengers from God, had even less authority than the Philistine warlords in terms of military might. Judges tells us that there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes, which is a scary sentence if you're familiar with human nature. Israel was not at its prime of holiness in the time of the judges. The book of Judges is filled with tales of human corruption and Israel continually rejecting the covenant with Yahweh and worshiping idols. God punishing them by bringing enemies upon them, the Israelites repenting, and God sending a new judge to pull them out of their latest predicament. And the cycle continues with judge after judge after judge. Finally, Israel is fed up with their lack of authority and demands a king so that they could be like other countries. They had rejected God's kingship so many times and fallen into enemy hands that they desire a human king, which is not the actual solution to their problem, but that's what they want. It seems that they had watched how Egypt, who has one king, had managed to beat the Philistines off. And so they wanted a king for themselves to help them beat off the Philistines. Well, they chose a Benjamite, a man named Saul who had everything Thing they wanted. He was tall and good looking and they named him their king and general so that he could lead them in military victory. The last judge of Israel, Samuel, who's also a prophet, anoints Saul as king properly. But he warned Israel that their demand for a king was an enormous mistake. Under Saul, Israel would be drafted into servitude and war and taxes. Nevertheless, they wanted him as king and Saul became king and commander and he organized an attack against the Philistines. Unfortunately for Saul, by the time he was made king, the Philistines had grown in their power and their power over Israel had expanded to the point that they were actually able to prevent Israel from having any blacksmiths. Think about that. If Israel doesn't have any blacksmiths, they cannot make weapons. So if an Israelite man had a plow or an axe that he wanted to sharpen, he had to go pay a Philistine blacksmith to do it for him. Therefore, when Saul gathers up all the fighting men from the tribes together, it transpires that only he and his son Jonathan have swords. Everyone else had hoes and pitchforks. The Philistines, on the other hand, assembled 3,000 chariots and 6,000 charioteers. One charioteer drives and the other one fights with both of his hands free. And after that, there were soldiers too great to count. The Israelites were outnumbered and outarmed on no uncertain terms. And unsurprisingly, they end up scattering and hiding themselves. Saul holds up at Gilgal, north of Jericho, with only 600 men who remained with him. For the remainder of Saul's reign, the Israelites push against Philistine strength by using guerrilla warfare, raids, and inconclusive battles but there is no decisive victory. In one of these indecisive battles at the Valley of Elah, the fighting went on so long that the Philistines propose a different kind of combat to settle the issue. The Philistines say, two champions, one from each side, should fight and whoever wins gets the loser's country. The Philistines expected Saul to be the Israelite champion. And the Philistine champion was, of course, the famous giant Goliath, who was somewhere between seven and nine feet tall, depending on what manuscript you read. Saul was also known for his height, but he wasn't as tall as Goliath by any means. Goliath was armed to the teeth and had been fighting since he was a kid. By selecting Goliath as their champion, the Philistines were making a statement about their superiority over the Israelites. Saul had no intention of fighting Goliath, but David, who's the youngest brother of three siblings who were in Saul's army, was confident that God was with him. He walked out to Goliath with a slingshot and killed Goliath with a well-placed stone to the head and then cut off the giant's head with his own sword. The Philistines fled at the sight of their dead hero and the men of Israel swarmed after the Philistines into the land all the way to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. David became so popular as a result of this victory that Saul began to fear him as a competitor for the throne and he decided to get rid of David. Oh, did I mention that before the whole thing with Goliath, David had been anointed by Samuel, who prophesied that he would be a king to take over Israel? Saul had 
disobeyed God and basically revoked his right to be king. David fled to Philistine territory to save his life. So he's fleeing from Saul and he flees into the territory of the Philistines. Here David became the employee of a Philistine warlord, but he acted as a double agent. He sacked the Philistine cities and when he returned with loot from Philistine cities, he reported to his Philistine employer that how he had attacked made up Israelite settlement. He just kind of came up with places that didn't actually exist. And so he managed to dupe the Philistines while he was secretly destroying their settlements. Eventually Saul was killed in battle with the Philistines and David returned to Israel to claim the throne. The first thing David did as king was to lay siege to the city of Jerusalem, which hadn't yet been conquered by Israel. It was still under control of Western Canaanites. The Bible calls them Jebusites. Who the Jebusites were is a little bit uncertain. It seems like they were a mixture of Western Semite and immigrants from the Arabian Peninsula. David conquers Jerusalem by leading an invading force through the water shafts cut into the rock beneath the city walls. He rebuilt the city as his own, which is why Jerusalem is called the City of David. With the 12 tribes under his authority, David extended the borders of his kingdom by marching down to the southeast and defeating the Edomites, the people who had controlled the land as far as the Red Sea. He defeated Moab, a tribe on the other side of the Dead Sea, and the tribes of Ammon to the north just across the Jordan. And he also decisively defeated the Philistines who had marched against Israel as soon as David became king. Once they found out that he was a double agent, they probably got quite upset about it and decided to march against David for humiliating them. David's rule marked the end of Philistine dominance as a strong kingdom, and Israel became the new power in the region of Canaan. David's kingdom was marked by extensive Israelite control over almost all of the Western Semitic lands, also because he did something that previous leaders of Israel had not managed to do. He had friendly relations with the leaders of other countries. He made an alliance with the king of Tyre was from the North Mediterranean coast. The inhabitants of Tyre were a Western Semitic tribe who had fled from their own home city of Sidon, which was further north of the coast. When the Sea People had sacked Sidon on their way down to Egypt, the Sidonians had settled in Tyre, and they brought with them a few of the invading Sea People from the Aegean. So the invading Sea People who had attacked Sidon and sent the Sidonians down to Tyre seemed to have a common ancestor to the Philistines, because they both worshipped Dagon, the fish god. At any rate, by the time of David's reign, the same people who had blended with these sea people had settled back into Sidon so that they owned now both Tyre and Sidon, as well as another ancient trading city called Byblos. The inhabitants of these three cities, who were a mixture of Western Semitic and Aegean, became known as the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians are the ones who inhabit Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos. To qualify, there was no country or city called Phoenicia, nor was there a Phoenician king. The three cities were independent from each other, but were united by their shared culture and language. It's an interesting fact about the Phoenicians that their writing system was the first to incorporate an alphabet, and they pretty much had full control over the trade of cedar logs, which they got from the nearby hills and sent to Egypt and Israel and other faraway places. 